Thank you. It's good to be back. I'm going to start from this slide and then skip through some of the other ones, but this is really starting with the basics of the actual structure of the nucleus. And we went through talking about how this is the third element. The first two are hydrogen and helium. They really almost aren't even quite elements yet in our mind. Um, they really are, but, but for the, the model, they're kind of predecessors to when we really start getting... Okay, thanks. They're, predecess or they're, they're early stages of the development. So we have lithium-7 here, which contains the seven protons. There are no neutrons. A neutron is really an inner electron. And in the atom, when, when conventional scientists talk about protons and neutrons, what we talk about is only protons and electrons. And the equivalent of a conventional proton is an external electron. And the conventional, and our idea of a conventional neutron is an internal electron. So it grows, starting with the lithium-7. This is a partial icosahedron, which is a, the, one of the platonic solids. And we step through these stages until we get to the carbon-12. And that is what we call the first nuclet. Now, I know people here have said they don't like it when people name things, so I'm naming this. And it's a name we came up with. It's just a cluster of protons that it creates a building block for the atom. Um, Valence is one of the key aspects of what we talk about. Valence is key to chemistry. It's how and why do the molecules create the way they do, and it's driven by valence. It's a very simple concept. A much more sophisticated concept includes valence, but it's called the oxidation state. So that's the term most chemists really actually use. And over here, I've blown it up. You can see part of this pattern for hydrogen through neon, the first, first I think, 11 elements. Um, the, the brighter ones here are the primary valence. The dimmer ones, it may be hard to see, are kind of less found in nature. But with, hidden within these bright ones are the actual valence, which is, which is a subset of the oxidation state. So let's go on. This is really when we start talking about the structure now. The standard model speaks about a proton and a neutron creating what's called a deuterium nucleus. It's actually the nucleus, is the, the atom, is called deuterium. If you take away the electron, this is called a deuteron. With just the two here, it's the actual nucleus. This is very, very small in comparison to the entire atom. Uh, it consists of one proton and one neutron. Our interpretation is it's two protons with an electron in between them. And the electron holds these two protons together. So conventional science would say that this is held together with the weak force. And I never understood. If this is really a proton and an electron, that's an electric, those are both electric, they should hold, it should hold itself together. But for some reason, and I really have I've tried to figure out why they developed or invented or created or discovered the weak force, which they've never detected anywhere. They just have it in mathematical formulas. But so the weak force holds the neutron together, and then the strong force holds the proton and the neutron together. And once again, the strong force is an elusive force that we haven't detected. We don't see any other forces in nature that have the characteristics of what the strong force is thought to have. Some people say it's a fourth power force. Some people say it's a fifth power force. They say that it attracts at long, dis at long distances, which Long distances is not much bigger than the nucleus. And then when you get it really, really close together, it starts to become repulsive. So we don't see a force like that otherwise in nature. So it's kind of a magical force, only for the atom. When we go to the next step, this is tritium. It's a form of hydrogen. Well, actually, up here is hydrogen one, just a single proton with one electron going around it. Deuterium, which is used in nuclear fusion experiments, is a proton and a neutron. It still is hydrogen. It only has one outside electron. Um, when we go to tritium, we still have only one inner proton. It still has only one outer electron. It still behaves like hydrogen. Our interpretation of the tritium is right here, where it's three protons with two electrons. And if you look at this, if you look at this one up here, this looks unbalanced to me. 
And this looks unbalanced to me. This looks very balanced. And the same with the tritium. Now we put it in a line like this because we make the assumption that this electron and this electron want to be as far apart as possible. They have the same charge. When we go to helium-3, we once again, in the conventional model, see it's unbalanced. But in the SAM model, it's not quite balanced. And this is actually, this uh, helium-3 lasts for about 13 days before it decays. But when we go to helium-4 now, this is the main helium. This is where we find almost all of our helium. Once again, the conventional bottle looks unbalanced, whereas we have two deuterons. Here's a deuteron with an electron. Here's a deuteron with an electron. And it creates the tetrahedron, which is the first platonic solid. And it's the first shape that has the, uh, or the um, properties of dense packing, where it's as small and as tight and as compact as it can be. Everything's nested together tightly, and it is a stable configuration. So this creates the first two elements of the periodic table. Um, there is some support. We are not the only ones saying this by any means whatsoever. One of the first papers I believe that Ito ran into is some, a paper by Carl Johnson. And the conventional theory would say that inside the nucleus there's all kinds of things going on. And we got to have gluons holding, gluons are the carriers for what is thought to be the strong force. And they hold this nucleus together. Um, so there's all kinds of things happening. We have something called binding energy. And the, the, the short story is they cannot calculate with mathematics a simple way to determine the weight of an atom based on the conventional theories. So Carl Johnson went through six years of NIST data. And NIST is the National Institute of Standards, I think, in technology in Boulder, Colorado. They have some of the most accurate information on the planet for masses and energies and properties of different elements and things. And so he went through six years of study on the NIST data, and he found out he didn't need to have all these other complications. He found all he had to do was add together the known mass of the proton with the known mass of the electron, multiply them by the number of electrons and the number of protons, add in the binding energy, and he's accurate to within 10 degrees or 10 decimal point accuracy of the resulting weight of the entire atom, or the, yes, the entire atom. I'm including the outer electrons and inner electrons. So it's an incredibly simple calculation. You look at some of these calculations, and I can't read them. I don't understand. I'm a computer programmer. I'm not a uh, mathematician, but I completely understand what Carl Johnson's doing here. It's addition and multiplication, no derivatives, no complicated missing particles or invisible particles or neutrinos. It's all very simple. In addition, he does a, another paper talking about why the neutrino doesn't exist. It was originally created to balance the spin equation, as I mentioned yesterday, and he claims that it's a very simple error in mathematics where they used scalar mathematics. They added it up like it's in a line. But in truth, it's a vector with a direction. Once you include the direction, then the neutrino doesn't need to exist. The spin equation balances without it. So here's some of his papers online. If you're really interested in this, they're very easy to read for someone who has a little bit of an understanding of science. And this paper here is some 30 pages long, giving lots and lots of graphs. I think this is monumental work. I don't know why it isn't. The guy deserves a Nobel Prize for what he's done here. It's really astounding. Another paper that was just published probably about six, seven months ago is by a gentleman named Andres, I think it's Andres Kovacs and William Stubbs. And this is very similar to what Andre Assisi, Assis just talked about, or, or he talked about yesterday, where we, re need, we need to redo the Maxwell equations, or according to what Andre says, we just need to go back in history and look at the original calculations. It's already been redone. And I know that they have their own mathematics, and I'd love to present this to Andre and see what, what he thinks of this, because it might be exactly what he's talking about. Now, they don't talk about Weaver, but... You can see his picture of the nucleus, or the deuteron, is very similar to ours. We just have spheres here, and he's got a torus, and we've got a sphere. And I've thought many times of changing it to the sphere, or to the torus. And part of the reason is, when I talked of duality yesterday, uh, that everything is dual in nature, and so the electron and proton have to be dual in nature. 
And the electron, the proton is heavy, structural, and large. The electron is small, and it's ethereal. It's, it's thought of as a wave or a field. So, and I, think, and I think of the sphere as kind of being an inverse of the torus. So it makes sense that the electron would also be a torus instead of a sphere. It'd be a simple program change. <laughs> So the evidence is emerging, though, that the strong and weak force do not exist. So there are four forces in nature. There's strong force, weak force, gravity, and electricity. And Einstein wanted to do the unification of all four of these forces. Well, I think we can throw out two of them. And that leaves two forces. And as uh, Wall was speaking this morning, the gravity is actually a side effect of electricity. So we've just done the unification of all the forces. There's one force in nature, and it's called electricity. So this has a little bit of colors. I've added some colors, and the reason is, is it becomes easier in larger atoms to see them. This is lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon, the first, or the, the second row of the periodic table. And we can see over here, we got plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, minus four for valence, minus three, minus two, minus one, back to zero, the law of the octaves, as I spoke of yesterday. And what we've done is we've, we've named, these are what we call the nuclets. This, this is all the building blocks of the, even the bigger atoms. Uranium is composed of these same building blocks. All the elements are composed of these building blocks. And there are, th this, Anyway, there are no other ones. There is a little a bright green one here that's kind of an anomaly. That is actually an extra, in conventional terms, neutron. In our terms, it's a place where we, a proton is attached to this atom, but there's no charge here for it to attach to. So it has to bring along its own charge so it can stick there, so it has an, an electron to go with it. That's, that's what a neutron is, is a proton and electron it brings its own electron. Once we complete, this is, this is the completion of the first nuclet, and now what we do is we start building and adding on a second nuclet. So the red here is a second nuclet added to this nuclet, and it's colored red because it's an identical in shape to the lithium, and it has a plus one valence like the lithium, and therefore sodium has a plus one valence. So sodium combines with chlorine, which has a minus one valence, and creates table salt. Um, this stage right here is what we call the growing phase. We're adding to it. The valence is increasing. We reach the perfect shape of the icosahedron. Now we add another deuteron onto it, and that starts what we call the capping phase. So this is where we go from four. We've capped one quadrant here. We're at minus, th minus three. We've capped two quadrants here. We're at minus two. We've capped three quadrants, plus there's this extra guy for balance. And that's a very difficult subject. That'd take a lot of time to explain. But this is minus one. At this point, we have capped all four points of the carbon. And we've reduced it back to zero. And we got neon, which is inert. It does not mix with any other element. You'll never see neon chloride or neon sulfate or neon anything, it doesn't even mix with itself. You won't see neon too. Neon is always by itself. And since it's so antisocial, it, it, does not, it does not combine with any other elements. It does not even combine with itself to make neon too. So how do we get the bigger elements? This is gold, and what we've done is we've combined together a whole bunch of those nuclets to create gold. Everywhere that you see the green, and even the bright green, these are neutralized. They're no longer active. They no longer combine with any other element. Gold, there's only one active nuclet. It's here in red. And this is the part that, we're, that acts with chemistry. So this is where the nucleus determines chemistry. And once again, conventional science doesn't even consider that. They think that the electrons spinning around in the outer shells are what's important, and they don't care about the nucleus, and they don't think the nucleus has anything to do with chemistry. It's the electrons on the outside. Um, I would say, and this is my quote, is that the distribution of charges within the nucleus determines the distribution of charges in the outer electrons. 
So the orbitals are determined by the nucleus. And that is completely against conventional science. Over here, I've broken it up. You can see that each one of these nuclets are actually a slightly modified or warped icosahedron. And they're combined together. These are all icosahedrons. At the end, we have that extra little neutron, or that proton and electron. And here we see the lithium. So that is, it grows in a fashion where we have one central nu nuclet. It then has two here and two here. That splits into two more here, two more here, two more here, two more here. And we go one more shell, and we've made it through the entire periodic table. So about a month ago, I created a program to create our own periodic table. And this is, Ido spent, I know, I don't know how many hours going through building each one of these atoms. And we now see the entire periodic table and the structure for, the, for each of the nuclei of the periodic table. And we haven't even had a chance to study this. I think once we really dig into this, we're going to start seeing new patterns and making some modifications to things. So the, the SAM is based upon observation. It's not a mathematical theory that we've abstracted into new things that we think the math describes to us. Instead, it's based upon looking at observation and finding a structure that seems to mimic what the observation that's being made. And the, one of the big things is the neutron-proton ratio, which I'll get into all of these. The valence, or the more sophisticated oxidation state. We have isotopes, some are stable, some not. Why is that? What are nuclear reactions and binding energy? And all of these things are play into how SAM is structured. So the first one is neutron-proton ratio. So if you look, carbon-6 has six, this is according to conventional theory, has six neutrons and six protons, or a ratio of one. Iron has, iron-56 has 56 total balls or spheres, nucleons, they're all protons. 30 of those bring their own electron along with them, and 26 of them are actual protons alone for a ratio of 1.25. When we get to uranium, we get to 1.59. And the question is, why do the larger elements have more neutrons than protons? And people have been wondering this for a long time. They think it's kind of like an extra glue or neutralizes the protons. There's a lot of theories as to why. We just simply say the structure dictates that that must be the way it is. And one of the reasons is, is that each child nuclet shares a proton with its parent. So here we have 12 protons, and it shares one, and it that doesn't show right. Oh, there's one. There's, you can see a missing one there. The missing one's hidden here. So this has 11 and 11 and 12. So right there, we already have two extra neutrons. There's two extra inner electrons, actually, in our theory. And then we also share one with here. Every time you add a new nuclet, you automatically get one more neutron than you have protons, according to conventional terms. In addition, we can add on these extra neutrons to, to account for isotopes that have additional neutrons. I hope the neutron-proton terminology is understandable here. We didn't really want to change the term proton, because these are protons. So neutron becomes a little bit confusing, because sometimes we use it in conventional sense, and sometimes we use it as meaning a proton and an electron. So this accounts for our extra neutrons, just by, just by the structure alone. This is called the table of nuclides. And we start with hydrogen down here. Each row is an element. We get all the way up to uranium is right here, where the last stable elements are. The black are stable elements. The blue and green are unstable, or stable isotopes. The blue and green are unstable isotopes. And an isotope is just an a, a element that has an extra neutron connector, or more than one extra neutrons, as in our case, we actually mean inner electrons. But you can see this pattern. I've blown up part of the pattern. Calcium-40 is stable. Calcium-41 is not. Calcium-42, 43, 44 is stable. 45 is not. Calcium-46 is stable. Oddly enough, that's the exact same pattern we see with nickel. The odds, so this is considered to be an even atomic number or an even element. The odd ones, there's only one. 
There's only one stable isotope, scandium, vanadium, manganese, and cobalt only have one stable isotope. Iron almost fits this pattern. There should be this iron 60. It's not quite the same. Whereas titanium, we have five stable isotopes. It's actually one of the, I think it's the only element that has five stable isotopes. So one question we have is why are some stable and some not? And we believe that the structure describes this and it's taken into account when Ito's building the atoms, he takes into account this type of information. And it's actually magic. We would love to find someone who'd like to go through this theory and look at how this works and redo his work and someone to argue with on it. Because right now it's just him and I and I don't like to argue. Key principles. So I mentioned the key principles earlier about duality and dense packing and balance and things like that that was mentioned yesterday. This is more of a, a paragraph instead of a bulleted list to put it more into a story. And that we have a duality, the proton and the electron pair with the electrostatic force acting between them. That's one of the basic points. This force is the causal mechanism for the principle of densest packing. So this electrostatic force between the protons and electrons pulls this nucleus together, and it pulls it together into a densely packed shape, spherically densely packed. Because they're densely packed, that creates the geometric shapes based on two of the platonic solids, the tetrahedron and icosahedron, which is four spheres and 12 spheres. The other three platonic solids, the octahedron, the cube, and the dodecahedron, are an unstable shape. They, they, they will fall apart. They are not, even, they may, they, even, octahedron kind of looks densely packed, but it's still based on four. I was talking about that yesterday. These shapes combine together in a tree-like fashion in a specific ordered sequence and number. And that structure determines, creates all the elements, all the isotopes, and determines the properties of the periodic table. So that's the same principles just reworded into more of a, a story. So I can't go through all of these. But these are all the things, these are just actually a partial list of what we think this structure describes in nature. And the first one is, why do all the elements in the same column, so the first column of the periodic table, all have a valence of one? And the, all the elements in the second column of the periodic table all have a valence of two. And it goes three, four, and then minus three, minus two, minus one. Um, why do the columns all the same? And it's because they all have the same active nuclet. So in the case of the first column, they all have this lithium ending somewhere, this red ending within their structure, and that, deter that determines the valence for that atom. Why are the majority of the elements metals? That's a little harder to describe. We have the, the building phase where we go one, two, three, four, minus, and then we start going minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one. These minuses come from a missing hole in the structure, and we think that the nature prefers the building phase over the what we call the capping phase with the hole. And so because of that, it, it, through the table, as you, get, as you get into the third, fourth, fifth row of the periodic table, you get a lot more possibilities, a lot more endings. It could grow here, 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 here. Whereas in the first part of the table, there are very few choices where it can grow. But it prefers that it, that it be in this active growing phase than to be in this capping phase. But however, the second to the last column of the periodic table all have a valence of minus one, and the very last column of the periodic table all have a valence of zero. So that kind of explains the third one. Um, varying spin numbers is something we're looking at. We haven't had a lot of time to look at it, but when you look at the balance between the right and left sides of the atom, we find out that neon 20 has a spin, and what spin is, is really debatable by people, but it has a spin of zero, but it's a very balanced structure. Whereas when we add one more neutron to get neon 21, it's got a valence of minus, of one? Whatever, it's not zero. When we get to, a when we get to neon 22, it's got a, an extra neutron or a proton-electron on both sides, and it's balanced again, and it has a spin of zero. 
So we've looked at some elements in this way. But there's a lot more work that needs to be done on that. Um, we can go on to beta plus. This is what Ida will be talking about after me. Um, here's the law of octaves. Stability we talked about. Um, this is an interesting one. Why are there no elements with five or eight nucleons? So you would think that we would have some element that has five nucleons, or in conventional terms, protons and neutrons, and there are none. There's no stable elements. They can make them, they last for a short period of time, but they quickly decay. And the reason is, is because the, the helium-4 is a tetrahedron, and when you add a fifth to it, it pushes in, it gets pulled into the structure, and it breaks it apart. It cannot be stable. And it, it'd take a little bit of time. It's taken me quite a while to figure out where this comes from. And the same happens with eight. And carbon dioxide is actually similar to neon in a way. It doesn't like to react. It likes to be by itself. It doesn't like to be broken down very easily. And the question would be why, and it's very similar to the things in the nucleus. And I really don't have time probably to go into it. But the last one is nuclear energy, and Ida will be talking about that also. Why does this structure explain what nuclear energy is? Which is not too bad a thing to figure out. So this kind of goes over some of the basic ideas. It's based on the proton-electron. The neutron is a proton-electron pair, no strong force does not need mathematical. And this is still the, one of the most exciting things about it. I think science should be a lot of fun for kids. And this is a theory that you can teach kids and maybe get some excitement back in science again. Um, it's static in nature. And I've had several people come up to me and talk to me about this one. This is a hard one for them to, to, uh, to believe in because we've been taught things are whizzing around and switching places and spinning and their light speed. And, and our, this, this, theory is that it's a static structure. If something moves, you now have an isotope or you have a new element. If, if the nucleus changes in any way, it changes the element. And it tends to resist the absorption of energy and that nature prefers to, to go to a ground state. It doesn't like to have high energy states. It's going to try to get rid of that energy and that the nucleus actually wants to be at, at a minimal energy state. So that gives us, why do we care about any of this? And you've heard the word transmutation a lot. Now in chemical reactions, we reorder or we switch around the elements into different configurations. Like you take sodium and chlorine, and you create sodium chloride, you got table salt. Um, so transmutation is when you actually change the nucleus. And this is not supposed to happen on Earth in a low temperature, low pressure environment. The nuclei should not change. It does in fission reactors on our power plants. It does in the hydrogen bomb, and it does, but those are high energy, high pressure, or, or very different environments. But when we get to, this gentleman here was mentioned by Wall, Corentin Louis Corvan, and he did a lot of experiments with biology. And the biggest one you always hear about is that chickens can still continue to make calcium eggs even though they're not fed calcium. It's when you quit feeding them potassium that they run out in the, out in the field and they start looking for mica, the little sparkly things, because they want potassium. And this has been observed by farmers for a long time. So potassium-39, you add one proton to it, you got calcium-40. Very simple, very low energy transaction and they end up still laying eggs made out of calcium. You take away the potassium, the eggs get soft. Um, this one's kind of a little bit longer to describe it. The desert workers are wearing boots and gloves and helmets and you know, on an oil rig and they're on hot metal and the sun's pounding down on them and conventional belief is that you drink water, it evaporates, it cools the body. Well, you'd have to drink a hell of a lot of water in those conditions in order to not die, quite frankly. And what, they, what Kervan found out is that you, we all have been told to drink plenty of salt when you go out in the heat. And sodium can transmute into potassium. They find in the urine of these workers high amounts of potassium, more potassium than they are being fed. And what they're actually doing is converting sodium into potassium. 
This is an endothermic reaction. It's an endothermic nuclear reaction, which means it's many, many, many times more efficient than a chemical reaction. And it's like, an, it's like a reverse microwave in your body, just pulling heat out of your body. So instead of generating excess heat, which everyone wants to do to create power, this is the opposite reaction where it sucks up the heat. And then this the last one. The last one's great. You've, you know of breatharians, people who live off of air. That's impossible, right? Air is 90% nitrogen, or 80% nitrogen. Bodies don't really use nitrogen. Well, all you have to do is move one deuteron from one of the nitrogens over to the other side, and you got carbon and oxygen. You have a carbohydrate. You could live off that. So it's a very simple process. And finally, seeds. When you, when you sprout a seed, you end up with different elements than what you start with. So I, a lot of you have heard of Peter Mungo Jupp. He's presented Electric Universe conferences. And he goes through talking about finding remains, petrified and fossilized remains. And what he's found out that, for example, this is a mastodon found up in North Dakota. This is most likely was created at the time of a Lakota Indian legend where the Thunderbirds came over. They zapped all the people, and many of them were killed. And the animals were turned into stone. And that's a common theme in a lot of things, is life being turned into stone. He says that the, the, the guy excavating this said, you can barely tell the difference between this calcium and this calcium, or sodium, or silicon, I mean. It's hard to say. This, well, I'll get to that. You can barely tell the difference between the surrounding material and the bones, and his belief is that when the electricity struck the earth from the Thunderbirds, it caused a transmutation of the carbon and water, and it created silicon. And then instantaneously, it did not take tens of thousands of years or millions of years, it was an instantaneous transmutation. And this is found, it's like a puddle with a whole bunch of these bones all together, and then next to it, there's not, there you can't find any. So it's just a very localized place where you find these petrified bones. And then you might find another one over here. And the Lakota Indians talk about this, about how they found piles of rocks that look like the animals. So these are actually uh, petrified trees found in Yellowstone. Um, I put that up because another story that, that Peter Mungo Jupp talks about is where a tree that was getting rained on got a power line fell over and it, it sat there for several hours and a few years later when they dug up the remains they found out that that tree had petrified and so somehow the electric power line caused the petri petrification. So how does that work? Well this is our picture of oxygen 16. It has the icosahedron in blue and these two extra deuterons in green and then it has this growth place where it wants to continue growing. This is our carbon. All you do is you take this one proton, move it over to there, and stick this on, and you got silicon. And silicon is the second most prevalent element found on Earth. Oxygen is first. So we got, and carbon is very prevalent in all life forms. So this is a simple way that a transmutation could occur. And it's really combining two of these nuclets together to create a new element. Now this is really cool. In India, there's a smelter, and it was built in the 1980s. It's modern, it's got all kinds of electronics weighing input, they got accounting systems, finding out how much material they purchased and how much they sold. And they found out for a period of time, they were, getting, they were putting in 20.5 tons of silicon, and yeah, I didn't quite get that right. So let me just tell it to you. 20.5 tons of silicon and iron, and they're getting 24.5 tons of silicon and iron mixed coming out. So somewhere four and a half tons of silicon and iron were being created somehow inside their machine. Now they put in these carbon electrodes. There's a huge carbon electrode, and it gets consumed in the process. In addition, they're putting in oxygen to inject it into the system. So that was so the oxygen and the carbon are going together to make more silicon. If you combine two silicons, you get iron. 
So that's where they're getting the extra iron and the extra silicon is through some kind of process of transmutation. They spent a lot of money and a lot of time trying to figure out how this works, and they, they really never successfully did so. Um, and it actually, I think it bankrupted them, from what I heard. They're no longer in business. You'd think they would be making all kinds of extra profit. And instead, they go bankrupt. But, so here's, we're sowing the carbon plus the oxygen gives us silicon. Silicon plus silicon gives us iron. Or possibly silicon plus carbon has an intermediate step of calcium, and calcium and oxygen gives us iron. And we're finding that in a lot of different articles and things we're reading that these are very well-known and, and things that people have, have found besides... This is a very common idea, is that silicon is being converted into calcium and calcium on into iron. And then we can go on to uh, silver and gold, but that's... That's, that's a little farther than we've been able to go so far, but we believe that's part of this process. This is a company in Russia, and they, have, um, they are in the business of making precious metals, is what this first thing says. They're taking radioactive waste, they're putting in an iron-eating bacteria, and they're breaking the radioactive waste down into lighter elements, and they're finding that they, within a process that takes millions of years normally, they can do in about three months. And they, ra they put out a cryptocurrency to raise money, and they, um, they're now building a facility to start doing production of this. And what they've decided that making precious metals isn't good enough. They're making medical isotopes that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a gram. And they figure that they will completely take over that market. And when they, and currently those things are being made in linear accelerators, are very expensive to make. And they figure that once they can do this, that the Western scientists might listen to them. So the atom's electric. It doesn't have a strong force. It doesn't have a weak force. It is held together by electricity. And we see transmutations occurring all around us, sometimes endothermic, sometimes exothermic. What we don't have is an understanding. We went to the Cold Fusion Conference in Fort Collins, and that was the big theme. We see stuff happening, we know something's happening, but we don't understand why. We believe that this theory will help them to understand what's actually going on. And once we do, we will be able to create new elements, generate cheap energy, clean up radioactive waste, explain sapphire. We got to take our message out there, guys. We got to go to social media. You got to click on the share button. You got to link it. You got to do everything you can to put this information out to everybody. The physicists are not going to go along with us. They are not going to listen to us for the most part. And we got to have an uprising, literally, from the people. So, I think, where next? Oh boy, that slide's great. Um, where we're going next is we're actually attending another ICCF conference this fall in Italy, and we're going to another one in um, Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic, and we're working on binding energy, Ida will get to that. So I think we're on the verge of a brand new physics, and everything here we're talking about with Sapphire and Andreas Sis and all this, we really riot are at the edge of coming up with a, a truly a new science that, that is going to revolutionize this world, so. Thank you.